this is Dr. Sushma, your uh, anatomy educator here at Oracle. In a series of seven classes of neuroanatomy, today we are starting with ventricles and dural venous sinuses. We here at Oracle offer you live classes, recorded sessions, notes, as well as MCQs. In the live classes, you'll have an educator who will come online and uh, they will clarify your doubts live. They'll teach all the concepts live. And if you can, if you have any doubts or if you're trying hard to concentrate, you can attend these classes and utilize this one, one and a half hours in which the educator comes and teaches live. And we also have uh, recorded sessions in which you can... Um, you know, go back to recorded videos and get your co concepts clarified if you haven't understood any in the live classes. Then we have notes, which have lots of diagrams and lots of crisp and concise information, all that you need to know for your uh, prof as well as entrance examinations. Then we also offer you MCQs, uh, you know, which are based on the recent CBME curriculum and which will be immensely helpful for your upcoming next examination. You can book for a personalized counseling session with us. You will be given a mentor and they'll be like your friend, you know. You can share all your concerns with them, whether uh, whether it is academic, academical or non-academical. You can definitely share all your concerns with them. They will and uh, understand and analyze all your uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses and they'll give you a a proper study plan which is customized only for you and uh, if you follow it blindly and trust your mentor and all your prof examinations will be will be like a cakewalk and we offer three different subscription models in the basic plan you receive pre-recorded classes live classes and quick revision exam modules in the standard plan you get pre-recorded live love live doubt clarification and quick revision examination modules in the premium model it's like all in one kind of uh, subscription where you in where you get everything you get pre-recorded sessions live class live doubt clarification one-on-one -on -one personalized guidance notes and revision express videos and you can use my coupon code Dr. Sushma20 for any additional discount on across all three subscription models. Okay. So, yeah, this is a tentative schedule we have. By 21st, we are finishing uh, with uh, most of the concepts and most of important class, important uh, topics of neuroanatomy. Later, we'll do cranial nerves and then cadaveric image discussion in the subsequent classes. All right. Yes, let's take the today's topic ventricles so basically before that let's just look at a clinical case uh, scenario here we've already done a little bit about csf so answering this question shouldn't be a problem for you we have a 55 year old male who presents to the emergency de department with severe onset headache confusion and visual disturbances look at the cues given on examination he is found to have papilledema and signs of increased intracranial pressure okay this is a clear cut case in which there is an increase in the uh, you know cerebral intracranial pressure now this raise in the intracranial pressure could be due to number one there could have you know we've, there could be a rupture in any blood vessel resulting in massive hemorrhage or there could be any mass effect a patient may have had a small tumor and finally now the tumor has grown so big that it's now compressing on certain structures or there's a midline shift or uh, you know uh, any other effect of the mass itself or there is a obstruction in the csf so csf flow and that is resulting in papillary edema okay next further investigation reveals there is a mass lesion in the brain obstruction of obstructing the csf circulation all right we have a mass which is pressing upon any of the structures that produce the CSF or that drain the CSF or they circulate the CSF, right? Then which structure is primarily responsible for the production of CSF circulation in, the, in this patient? So production of CSF, we all know, is by the choroid plexus. I suppose there is no doubt with this, right? Cerebellum, definitely no. Cerebral aqueduct is just the one that circulates it. Arachinoid granulations are the ones which are important for the circulation. Correct? Yes. Now, let's go to ventricles. So, what are these ventricles, guys? Ventricles are nothing but the communicating cavity within the CNS that are lined by the ependymal cells which, produce the, which produces and contains and circulates the CSF. 
okay what are ventricles ventricles are nothing but your empty cavities inside the brain that's it correct now these ventricles are the structures within the cns that are lined by ependymal cells i hope you have uh, you know idea about different uh, types of neurons and one of the cells is the ependymal cell that produces and contains and circulates the csf now ventricular system mainly comprises of this lateral ventricle on either side there is a third ventricle and there is a fourth ventricle so basically we have two lateral ventricles single third ventricle single fourth ventricle and single terminal ventricle and all of these ventricles they communicate with each other right this communication is what is responsible for the production and the circulation of csf right so this this communication between the ventricles is what is responsible for the production as well as the circulation of the csf now look at this on either side of the brain suppose if i hold the brain like this cadaveric section or and on either side of the corp you know this is the corpus callosum that divides the brain into two halves either side of the corpus callosum i have the lateral ventricles one single third ventricle is present in the middle then it is connected to the fourth ventricle via aqueduct of sylvius and then fourth ventricle is present i've already told you near the mid brain pons and middle near the brain stem correct what lies near the floor of the fourth ventricle is it the open part of medulla or the closed part of medulla we have already discussed this can i know the answer in the next class yes you have to tell me floor of the fourth ventricle is related to open part of medulla or closed part of medulla now these ventricles or the empty cavities that contain csf are interconnected by the foramen of monro cerebral aqueduct foramen of megandy and lushka now foramen of monro connects lateral to third ventricle aqueduct of sylvius connects third to fourth ventricle megandy and lushka connects fourth ventricle to subarachnoid space or cisterna magna within the subarachnoid space guys i've i've explained how subarachnoid granulations are very important in the circulation of csf i hope you remember all right we basically we have two lateral ventricles one third ventricle and one one fourth ventricle the lateral and the third ventricles are connected by the foramen of monro third and fourth is connected by aqueduct of sylvius then fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space is connected by foramen of megandy and lushka understood no doubt still so far yes let's go here is another image showing different ventricles and their connections you can clearly see these two are the lateral ventricles right you can see how it is a c shaped cavity and then we have one third ventricle which is in the middle of the brain then i can see the cerebral aqueduct and i can see the diamond shaped fourth ventricle here and this is the central canal of the spinal cord in this guys in this what are the other structures that can be seen i can see pons here i can see can you see this elevation what is this rounded elevation either it it is pyramid or olive this is olive this is more lateral so this is olive if i remove this inferior cerebellar peduncle and i reflect the and i remove this uh, inferior cerebellar peduncle and then take out the cerebellum i can even visualize the pyramids over there but coming back to the topic i can see two lateral ventricles one third ventricle aqueduct of sylvius fourth ventricle and this is central canal of the spinal cord and this is how the csf production takes place and csf circulation takes place in the same direction okay let's talk about the lateral ventricle the structure marked in green is the lateral ventricle okay yes now lateral ventricle basically has an anterior horn a posterior horn and an inferior horn and relations of all three horns is extremely important for us because this is what is asked in your examination relations of lateral ventricle in itself is a question in which it is divided into anterior posterior and inferior horns let us first look at the body of the fourth 
sorry, body of the lateral ventricle. So this part, I'm talking about this part. Now, if you look at the structure, where does it lie? This is the frontal lobe. This is the occipital lobe. And this is the temporal lobe. And here is the parietal lobe, isn't it? So body of the fourth ventricle lies in the parietal lobe. Roof is bounded by the corpus callosum. Floor is bounded. This is the roof. Correct? Look at this, guys. So, this is where the corpus callosum is, right? Corpus callosum is present from here to here. From rostrum till the genu, it is, this is where the corpus callosum is present. So, the roof is formed by the corpus callosum. Floor is formed by, it is actually sloping from lateral to medial. It is formed by the body of the caudate nucleus, upper surface of thalamus, choroid plexus and body of fornix. Anything is ringing in your brain when you're hearing these words. In the previous class, while explaining basal ganglia, I showed many pictures of body of caudate nucleus and the thalamus, insular cortex, white matter, sorry, uh, internal capsule, external capsule. Remembering anything? Are you getting an orientation where exactly the body of the fourth, body of the lateral ventricle is? You have to orient yourself to understand this topic. Otherwise, you will not understand. Right? Now, medial wall is formed by the septum pellucidum. Lateral wall is a narrow area at the meeting of roof and floor. Look at this beautiful diagram, guys. So, this is where the body of the fourth ventricle is. What is this section? I've taken a section like this. Okay? I'm holding the brain like this. I've taken a section like this. What is this section? This is a coronal section. This is the sagittal section. I hope you are well versed with these sections. You, If you do not understand this, you will not know. You will not orient yourself. So, what is this section I'm talking about? I'm holding the brain like this and I'm cutting the brain into half like this. I've chopped the brain into half, cut the brain into half. Now, I am looking at the first half or the anterior structure. This is how it looks like, the image on your screens. Now, <clears throat> these two are the anterior horns of the lateral ventricle, which is bounded medially by the septum pellucidum. Septum pellucidum and this is the corpus callosum. Then, what is this? The structure is the caudate nucleus. This is the putamen. Caudate and putamen, where is globus pallidus then? You will tell me. And then where will be thalamus? Thalamus will be somewhere down here. This is the claustrum. The yellow structure that you see on, uh, on, on all cadaveric images. This is the insular, insular cortex and you'll have the internal capsule like this. Are you able to orient yourself see you will definitely nobody can make you imagine you are the one who will have to imagine this okay yeah the anterior horn is located in the frontal lobe this is a section i have taken here and i'm looking in the previous image i've taken a section at this level and i'm seeing from behind correct roof is by the corpus callosum floor is uh, again by the rostrum of the corpus uh, callosum and the caudate nucleus. Anteriorly, it is bounded by the genu of the corpus callosum. Medially, it is by the septum pellucidum. The medial relation remains the same across. It is the septum pellucidum here. Then let's talk about the posterior horn. So this will be the anterior horn of the, uh, you know, uh, my ventricle. That is the uh, anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. Correct? Now it is related to corpus callosum throughout. It is related to different structures of the corpus callosum throughout, right? Roof is the trunk of the corpus callosum. Floor is the rostrum, that is the head of the corpus callosum. Anteriorly, it is related to the genu of the corpus callosum. Let's talk about the posterior horn. Posterior horn, the location is in the occipital lobe, as you can see here. Next. Roof on the lateral wall is formed by the tapetum of the corpus callosum. Medially, there are two elevations, bulb of posterior horn that is formed by the forceps major, calcar avis produced by the calcarine sulcus. I hope you know about the white matter bundles, correct? Uh, you should know about the white matter bundles that are there. The formix, forceps major, minor and all of these structures are very important. They'll be asked in your viva, right? Then let's talk about the inferior horn. This is exactly where the inferior horn is. This particular structure or this particular section 
is very important for all your examination okay this is a very important section uh, cadaveric section which will be asked in all your entrance examination so this is the inferior horn of the ventricles which you can see is related to the hippocampus not exactly related to thalamus but it is also related to all of these structures isn't it inferior horn is located in the temporal lobe this is the parietal lobe frontal lobe occipital temporal lobe roof is formed by the tapetum and the tail of the caudate nucleus amygdaloid nucleus and striae terminalis floor is formed by the hippocampus fimbri of hippocampus and collateral eminence all right yes let's go to the third ventricle lateral ventricle is not as important as the third ventricle but third ventricle and its relations are extremely important what is the location of the third ventricle it is present between the two thalamus in this you know section if you have to see where will be the third ventricle in this section if you have to identify which is the third ventricle this will be the third ventricle is it not these two are my what are these these are my anterior horns of the lateral ventricle so correct then what is this this is the third ventricle which is present between the two thalamus one thalamus is here another thalamus is here correct now third ventricle is present between two thalami roof is formed by the fornix floor is formed by the hypothalamus laterally it is uh, bounded by thalamus as well as hypothalamus anteriorly lamina terminalis posteriorly opening into the cerebral aqueduct posterior commissural fibers pineal recess and habenular commissure habenular commissure just look at this beautiful diagram here guys here itself you can make out so many relations it is bounded by thalamus and hypothalamus laterally posteriorly it is related to the aqueduct of sylvius habenular commissure and pineal recess and everything isn't it see once you orient yourself to where exactly these ventricles are present it becomes extremely easy for you otherwise no matter how much i explain you will not understand you are the one who will have to imagine this and understand all right let's go to the fourth ventricle so what is the location of the fourth ventricle it's present anterior to the cerebellum posterior to pons and superior half of the medulla oblongata superior half of half of the medulla oblongata is the open part of the medulla oblongata isn't it now this fourth ventricle is present in the anterior to the cerebellum posterior to pons and superior half of the medulla oblongata so this is exactly where the fourth ventricle is present as you can see it is between uh, let's say this is pons and medulla and this is cerebellum somewhere here is the fourth ventricle the cavity is here isn't it this is the fourth ventricle which is present anterior to cerebellum posterior to brain stem pons and medulla correct now floor of the fourth ventricle is some somewhat we have already discussed in the previous section right when i was explaining the upper part of the medulla i have explained all of these structures what is this structure this is the striae medullaris now floor of the fourth ventricle is what is the structure that i have marked here now it is formed by the posterior surface of the pons and cranial half of the medulla oblongata laterally it is bounded by you can see this is the inferior cerebellar peduncle and superior cerebellar peduncle roof is formed by ten shaped roof which projects into the cerebellum okay yes now let's just take some mcqs out of all these ventricles i would say third ventricle is little important all the other ventricles are not so important and uh, i know i understand that it's very difficult to remember the relations but we have to mug up it guys i mean you just imagine where these ventricles are present where exactly these ventricles are present and try to orient yourself that is the only way uh, you know i can tell you that's the only way i did in in my first year in, uh, examination that's way that's the only way that anybody can do all right now what is the mcq the patient presents with a tumor obstructing the cerebral aqueduct which ventricle is more likely to be affected by this obstruction now guys when aqueduct of sylvius is blocked cerebral aqueduct is blocked what happens the csf from third ventricle cannot enter the fourth ventricle now the csf within the third ventricle starts getting accumulated 
if there is any increase in the pressure in the third ventricle obviously there is a back pressure which raises in in the lateral ventricle isn't it so the most affected ventricle by this would be the third ventricle and not the fourth ventricle why because inside the third ventricle now all of the csf is getting accumulated inside the third ventricle that raises the icp that raises the intracranial pressure so the most affected ventricle in this scenario would be the third ventricle okay yes now let's look at the dural venous sinuses i hope you have got an idea about ventricles i know it's a difficult topic i know it's not a very pleasant topic to study there is nothing really conceptual that i can teach it's plain theory uh, whatever that is conceptual is taught in physiology unfortunately when it comes to csf anatomy wise i mean i don't really have anything that i can teach in in terms of concepts correct and if i start teaching concepts or going depth then you will find it boring or you will find it irrelevant for this level maybe ventricles is uh, i wouldn't say it is important even for your entrance examinations there are other topics which are more important like when we did the brain stem or cerebellum basal ganglia these are the topic that are actually conceptual and you need to know the anatomy aspect as well to understand the concepts right when you study the direct pathway and indirect pathway when you hear globus pallidus interna you should know what exactly the teacher is trying to teach you you should orient yourself globus pallidus okay oh putamen and globus pallidus is here the medial one is gp lateral one is putamen and then then i have the internal capsule then i have the thalam so you you should you need to orient yourself then it becomes very easy okay those topics are slightly conceptual but this venous sinuses dural venous uh, sinuses dural folds extensions and all of these are you know uh, they are just theory topics you, we will have to study we will have to mug up we don't have any other choice if we have to score good marks and pass in our exams all right let's go into dural venous sinuses now the name only says it is something related to dura dura mater correct what are the layers of meninges we have dura mater arachnoid and pia mater between the dura the uppermost the outermost is the dura mater the it, the venous sinuses are sort of superficial and they lie between the layers of the dura mater now the some interesting things about uh, the uh, dural venous sinuses is that they have no muscles in their walls they have no muscles in their walls correct then they are lined by endothelium and valves are also as absent what does it mean that means blood can flow in any direction if there is a valve it allows blood only to flow in one particular direction but here there is no valve present so blood can flow in any direction and it it receives its venous blood and csf i hope you know the venous uh, drainage of csf into this venous system in through our last sessions all right yeah classification of sinuses basically the sinuses are classified into unpaired sinuses paired sinuses right now if i were you i would remember the paired sinuses and not the unpaired ones paired sinuses is something you remember unpaired is something that will i will not remember because these are the sinuses where which are important clinically also these are the uh, you know sinuses in which questions are asked correct what are the paired sinuses we have cavernous sinus superior petrosal inferior petrosal transverse sinus sigmoid sinus pinoparietal sinus petrosquamous sinus out of paired sinuses the most important is the cavernous sinus okay okay important or something that you have to know is the sigmoid and the transverse sinus and rest everything is not so important unpaired sinuses superior sagittal inferior sagittal straight sinus occipital sinus anterior intercavernous posterior intercavernous and basilar venous plexus remember this guys remember this because it is easy to remember why i tell you cavernous sinus something that all of us know one is done superior and inferior petrosal another sinus is also done two two sinuses are sorted here then i have spinoparietal petrosquamous a, you can if you see here many many sinuses here have a p letter in them correct any sinus if you get confused 
if if it has a letter p more number of p letters than it is a paired sinus except for posterior intercavernous it starts with p so it is not a paired sinus but look at look at this these seven sinuses here superior petrosal many p's here inferior petrosal again a p spino parietal p petrosquamous starts with p so if you see any sinus with many p's then it is a paired sinus that's how i had remembered because these questions are asked they'll ask you to write the paired and unpaired sinuses example as a three marker question or they'll be asked in your viva also okay any sinus with many p's is a paired sinus this is how you can remember cavernous is everybody remembers it's a paired sinus nobody will go wrong with cavernous sinus if you go wrong you will fail in your exam all right yeah then we have superior first start with superior sagittal sinus so superior sagittal sinus is occupying the upper fixed border of the fox cerebri you know the dural folds right there is a fox cerebri which extending from anterior to posterior like this then there is a tentorum cerebelli i hope you have an sort of a at least basic orientation towards the dural folds superior sagittal sinus occupies the upper border of the fox cerebri it begins in the front of the foramen cecum and it receives its vein from the nasal cavity okay then it runs backward and backward and backward growing the vault of the skull at the internal occipital protuberance it deviates to one side and becomes continuous with the transverse sinus then it communicates through small openings with two or three venous lacunae on each side there is numerous arachnoid villi and granulations that project into these lacune which also receive the diploic emissary and meningeal veins not very important this point is not so important it receives the superior cerebral vein this is the point that you have to remember it communicates with two or three uh, through the small openings with two or three venous lacunae on each side correct and it receives its uh you know tributaries from the superior cerebral vein again you don't have to really mug this up why it's a superior sagittal sinus and it receives its tributaries from the superior cerebral vein at the internal occipital protuberance it is dilated to form the confluence of sinuses which is connected to the opposite transverse sinus and it receives the occipital sinus at the internal occ uh, occipital protuberance via the occipital sinus so this is the superior you can see that what is the structure that is running around throughout this blue 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 colors this is the dural venous sinuses now this sinus which is running like this this is the superior sagittal sinus which at the internal protuberance continues further as the straight sinus correct understanding what is this sort of greenish color this is the fox cerebri continuing further is the tentorium cerebelli correct tentorium cerebelli so this bluish structure in the top is what is the my superior sagittal sinus and the niche wala ye wala chotu sa this is inferior sagittal sinus which is continuing further down as straight sinus confluence of sinuses is the point where all the sinuses meet that's it okay you can see how the sigmoid sinus here is also going and meeting at the uh, right transverse sinus going and to the confluence of sinuses correct what you have to know here is basically how the sinus starts and how the how it ends that's all you need to know okay yes clinical anatomy thrombosis anywhere you know guys it's just a venous channel what happens when there is a thrombosis there is accumulation of veins when there is accumulation of sorry accumulation of blood in the veins when there is accumulation of anything in the cranial cavity whether it is csf blood it causes raise in intracranial pressure correct anything in, in the brain what what are the different things we have we have the brain tissue cerebral tissues correct neuronal tissues number 2 what do we have we have csf number 3 we have blood other than these three we don't have anything else in the brain okay whenever any of whenever there is no balance between these three either there is a mass effect that there is a tumor or something that is growing in the brain there is an increase in csf or there is accumulation of blood 
all three conditions will lead to a rise in icp that's now spread of infection from nose scalp uh, and dipole to the superior may cause its thrombosis this is a dangerous area of face right and spread of infection from the nose and scalp can cause the presenting feature of thrombosis are of course increase in icp due to defective absorption of csf and delirium okay next let's go to the inferior sagittal sinus which occupies the free lower margin of the fox cerebri it runs backwards and joins the great cerebral vein which is formed by the union of two internal cerebral veins at the free margin of the tentorium cerebelli to form the straight sinus okay it receives cerebral veins from the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere now this is the inferior sagittal sinus you can draw a simple line diagram for this guys not so important inferior sagittal sinus is not so out of all the sinuses cavernous sinus is the one which you have to pay attention to rest everything is not so important then i'm just i'm just including all of this for the sake of completion correct now transverse sinus they are paired and they begin at the internal occipital protuberance the right sinus usually continues with the superior sagittal sinus left is continuous with the straight sinus each sinus occupies the attached margin of the tentorium cerebelli grooving the occipital bone and posterior inferior angle of the parietal bone don't even try to remember any of this i've just included all this information for the sake of completion and in case you have any doubts you can go back to this slide and understand all right then <coughs> sigmoid sinus sigmoid sinus is sort of important it is a direct continuation of the transverse sinus and each sinus turns downwards and medially and groups the mastoid part of the temporal bone here it lies behind the mastoid antrum this structure guys the the one the bony prominence behind your ears when whenever you take your fingers and when palpate behind your ears the bony prominence that you see is the mastoid and what is the sinus that is there behind the mastoid is sigmoid sinus you place your hand below your ear on the mastoid what sinus is there sigmoid sinus sigmoid sinus this is very important when it comes to your ent okay now this sinus turns downwards and medially and it grooves the mastoid part of the temporal bone where it lies in the mastoid antrum okay then it turns downwards through the posterior part of the jugular foramen to become continuous with the superior bulb of the internal jugular vein now sigmoid sinus is continuous with the internal jugular vein okay yes you can see here this is the what is the superior sagittal inferior sagittal correct and here you can see inferior petrosal superior petrosal and occipital and this is the confluence of the sinuses that you can see and behind the mastoid antrum you'll have the sigmoid sinus which continues further down as the ijv now which dural sinus receives blood from superior and inferior sinuses we have that is answer to this question is straight sinus straight sinus receives the blood from superior and inferior sagittal sinuses if you want to study this topic in detail this you know takes a lot of time because first for that we have to explain uh, what dural folds are and how they are oriented then we have to take each and every sinus and draw the tributaries and it takes a lot of time i definitely can't explain this in the 30 minutes i've just included the important points here let's take another question which of the following dural sinuses is located within the fox cerebri simple inferior and superior sagittal sinuses both are included in the upper and the lower parts of the fox cerebri okay yes now clinically sigmoid sinus is separated from the mastoid antrum by mastoid air cells by a thin plate of bone right by a thin plate of bone the thrombosis of the sigmoid sinus is therefore secondary to infection of the middle ear or mastoid process correct whenever there is a thrombosis of the sigmoid sinus what happens leads to middle ear and middle ear infection no if you go on drilling if you go on drilling through this mastoid bone what will you reach you will reach the middle ear cavity 
that is how many surgeries are done in the middle ear let's say there is cholesteatoma what do we do uh, excuse me guys just just excuse me i'll just there's a phone call just excuse me sorry yeah so if you go on drilling into the mastoid what do we see exactly where do we enter we enter into the middle ear cavity that is how you remove any cholesteatoma or that is how you we do many surgeries middle ear surgeries are done that way so when there is any thrombosis of the sigmoid sinus it has such easy access to the middle ear cavity whether it is thrombosis or whether it is um you know any 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 infection in the middle ear cavity can also cause the thrombosis of the sigmoid sinus the other way around is also true right yeah so utmost care must be ta taken not to expose sigmoid sinus during the operations on the mastoid process that's what i was trying to get to when you start drilling when you start drilling through the mastoid antrum we know that the sigmoid sinus and the mastoid is actually separated by a very thin plate of bone if that bone is broken or if the bone is uh, broken i'm straight going and hitting the sigmoid sinus what happens then there will be massive bleed patient will bleed to death so that is why your anatomy that you're learning in the first year can decide how you perform your surgery right of course they'll teach you more in ent but when you place your hand between your ears what do you palpate mastoid process behind mastoid process what do we have sigmoid sinus okay yeah next superior and inferior petrosal sinuses they are small and they are situated on the superior and inferior borders of the petrous part of the temporal bone on each side so petrous part of the temporal bone you know the middle middle part the temporal bone is a butterfly shaped bone you know the osteology are you aware of it i hope you are aware of it because it is very very important okay squamous part and the petrous part of temporal bone and the structures in the foramina are related to that and structures coming out of these foramina are equally important each superior sinus drains the cavernous sinus into the transverse sinus each inferior sinus drains the cavernous sinus into the ijv okay not so important superior and inferior petrosal sinuses is not very important for your exams then next we have occipital sinus occipital sinus is a small sinus occupying the attached mar margin of the fox cerebri it communicates with the vertebral veins near the foramen magnum superiorly drains into the confluence of sinuses again not very important for your examination confluence of sinuses it is the region where the superior sagittal straight sinus they end and the right and left transverse sinuses begin so basically superior sagittal sinus comes and ends there straight sinus comes and ends there from here the right and left transverse sinuses begin which further continue as sigmoid sinus correct the occipital sinus also comes and drains near drains into the uh, uh, in the confluence of sinuses now confluence is the meeting point of so many sinuses superior sagittal straight sinus right and left transverse sinus occipital sinus where is this situated near the internal occipital protuberance okay this confluence of sinus is a important structure what are the different structures what are the different sinuses draining there superior sagittal straight sinus right and left transverse occipital understood yes let's go to basilar venous sinus again it consists of networks of veins lying between the two layers of dura on the clivus it connects the two inferior petrosal sinuses and communicates with the internal vertebral venous plexus receives its blood from the pons and the medulla thrombosis of the basilar venous plexus is usually fatal not important for your level spinoparietal petrosquamous sinuses again just for the completion sake i've included it not at all important for your examination anterior and posterior intercavernous sinuses anterior and posterior intercavernous sinuses connect the cavernous sinuses cavernous sinus is a paired sinus isn't it they are connected by this intercavernous sinus now they pass through the diaphragma cellae in front 
and behind the opening of the infundibulum of the pituitary gland okay they pass through the you you, you know what diaphragm is la is right the pituitary stalk and the diaphragm is la and the cribriform plate in the front i hope you are getting oriented to this now this intercavernous sinus and cavernous sinuses together form the circular sinus okay now the most important sinus of all is the cavernous sinus cavernous sinus is one that is asked so many times in your examination and it is very very important to us what is the location they are situated in the middle cranial fossa on each side of the body of the sphenoid bone right if let's say this is the temp this is the sphenoid bone like this here you have the cavernous sinus body of the sphenoid bone this is where the cavernous sinus is present on either side of the body of the sphenoid bone what is the extent each sinus extends from the superior orbital fissure in the front to the apex of the petrous part of the temporal bone behind extent is also very important look at this guys this is the body of the sphenoid correct this is where we have the cavernous sinus cavernous sinus and this is the confluence of sinuses which is present in the internal occipital protuberance correct this is where the cavernous sinus is present what do we see here internal carotid artery we will see how internal carotid artery is related to cavernous sinus okay this is the body of sphenoid superior orbital fissure this is the cribriform plate the chotu 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 things the pores that you see here is the cribriform plate this is the foramen magnum and i hope you are able to identify what these structures are what is the structure what is this what is this? what are these three foramens that we have very 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 important and the structures passing them through is also very important okay which we'll cover in the cadaveric image discussion now what are the relations superiorly it is related to everything that is related to eye how do we remember cavernous sinus superior relation is eye optic chiasma optic tract internal carotid artery and anterior perforated substance okay now what is this perforated substance i have already explained this in your previous class also perforated substances exist because i need the arteries in the veins to pass through this and supply the deeper structure posterior perforated perforated substance where did we study you will answer me in the next class inferiorly it is related to foramen lacerum junction on the body of the greater wing of sphenoid bone medially it is related to pituitary gland and sphenoidal sinus very easy guys look at this medially it is related to pituitary gland and everything superiorly it is related to all of these structures from the eye you have the optic tract and everything coming like this isn't it from the eye you have the optic tract optic radiation coming like this superior relation ho gaya correct superiorly it is related to this optic tract and everything laterally uh, medially it is related to these structures pituitary and other structures isn't it very easy uh, cavernous sinus relations are actually very easy inferiorly it sits on the foramen lacerum so foramen lacerum through the foramen lacerum the ica enters into the cranial cavity that is how it becomes a relation or a content of the cavernous sinus the common carotid artery divides into uh, you know it common carotid continues as external carotid and it gives off internal carotid as the internal carotid enters right as it travels and it enters the cranial cavity it enters through the foramen lacerum and my cavernous sinus sits on the foramen lacerum like this as the internal carotid artery enters it becomes a content of the cavernous sinus and also its superior relation it takes a turn like this and goes correct so inferiorly it sits on the foramen lacerum that is how the internal carotid artery becomes related to cavernous sinus okay laterally temporal lobe and cavum trigeminal not very important remember temporal lobe anteriorly superior orbital fissure and apex of the or orbit posterior is crus cerebri and apex of the petrous temporal bone what is crus cerebri guys what is crus cerebri cerebral peduncles what are cerebral peduncles where did we study them 
मिड ब्रेन करेक्ट एंटीरियर एस्पेक्ट मिड ब्रेन हेज क्रस सेरेब्रल पिडंकल्स करेक्ट लुक एट दिस लुक एट दिस ब्यूटिफुल डायग्रम सो पोस्टीरियरली इट इज रिलेटेड टू मिड ब्रेन सेरेब्रल पिडंकल्स right now what are the structures that are present in the lateral wall now if we let us say let's imagine guys i'm saying that cavernous sinus is related to cerebral peduncles meaning it is related to mid brain what are the vein uh, nerves that come out of the mid brain 3 4 and 5 what are the contents that will be present or related to cavernous sinus again 3 oculomotor 4 trochlear of thalamic vein and maxillary of thalamic nerve and maxillary nerve what are these nerves these are these are mesencephalic that is these are motor nerves of trigeminal is there anything to mug up over here from above downwards 3 4 5 nerves are related in the lateral wall why because it is related to the mid brain what structure is it related to presbyterium what structures will be present in the lateral wall 3 4 5 nerves oculomotor trochlear v1 and v2 v1 and v3 sorry v2 is not a content correct now what are the structures that pass through the cavernous sinus obviously internal carotid artery sur surrounded by the sympathetic plexus and abducens nerve how internal carotid artery this is the foramen lacerum cavernous sinus is sitting over it internal carotid artery enters the foramen lacerum and passes through the cavernous sinus anything to mug up here if you understand the concept absolutely no then what are the tributaries of cavernous sinus from orbit it gets superior ophthalmic inferior ophthalmic and central vein of retina i'm sorry i, I don't have any uh, concept over here this, this is very uh you know theory aspect which you have to know from meninges we have spinoparietal sinus and anterior trunk of middle meningeal vein from the brain we have superior and middle cerebral vein and inferior cerebral veins these are the tip tributaries how what are the communications of course transverse sinus via superior petrosal ijv via inferior petrosal pterygoid venous plexus via emissary veins through foramen ovale and lacerum facial vein via deep facial veins okay yeah opposite cavernous sinus of of course it communicates or to with the opposite cavernous sinus via intercavernous sinuses superior sagittal sinus via the superior superficial middle cerebral vein and superior anastomotic vein internal vertebral venous plexus via basilar venous plexus okay now this is a simple a uh, diagram that i have made i'm sorry i don't have any mnemonics or anything to you just have to mug this up by using this diagram all right next applied anatomy of cavernous sinus is very very important because if there is any thrombosis of the cavernous sinus what happens intracranial pressure will be raised but cavernous sinus also communicates with so many veins that are draining the eye so cavernous sinus by its location itself is very vulnerable and it will any thrombosis or any infection in the cavernous sinus will cause severe eye manifestations why it is related to so many ocular structure what was the superior relation all of these structures optic tract radiation they are all the superior relations of the cavernous sinus from there the infection can spread into the eye or from there the raised icp can damage the structures in the eye isn't it what are the symptoms any thrombosis or any infection in the cavernous sinus by its numerous communication all of these are different communications only right anywhere the infection can be brought into the cavernous sinus what are the different symptoms pain in the eye and also the forehead why because maxillary uh, you know vein is also one of the contents of the lateral wall right then there will be paralysis of ocular muscles why ocular motor nerve may be damaged then there can be exophthalmos because when there is so much pressure back pressure right something is pushing the eyeballs out because here is the cavernous sinus and somewhere here is the eyeball when there is an increased pressure in the cavernous sinus it pushes the eyeball out that is called as exophthalmos right the abnormal protrusion of the eyeball or the eyeballs is called as exophthalmos 
then there is arterio venous communication if the ic because see ica is a something that is entering into the cavernous sinus along with the sympathetic plexus so sympathetic plexus when it gets damaged it can cause horner syndrome if there is any damage to the ica correct whether it is a fracture of the base of the skull or any any uh, you know motorcycle fracture or any fracture that can cause an arterio venous fistula because the veins in the cavernous sinus and the internal carotid artery are very closely related that may damage both and it can cause a av fistula once an av fistula is uh, established there will be a sudden increase in the intracranial tension and patient may die on spot right now arterial blood rushes into the cavernous sinus then what happens there will be a massive engorgement of all the veins in the head and they all they may rupture and they may suddenly increase the icp next when there is this av communication when the arterio venous communication is established it causes pulsating exophthalmos meaning every time the heart beats correct when the heart beats what happens it pumps the blood into uh, different arterial systems. It goes from aorta to common carotid to internal carotid. Every time the heart beats, the blood enters uh, internal carotid artery. The same blood enters into the venous system also. The same blood goes into the veins that are communicating with the cavernous sinus and that cause pulsating exophthalmos. Heart beats, eyeball goes. Heart beats, eyeball goes out. This is called as pulsating exophthalmos. This is a clear cut sign that there is an AV communication that is established. I immediately need to decompress and immediately need to do a ventriculotomy and remove, you know, reduce the intracranial pressure and start, stop this AV uh, shunt and then do some shunt surgeries. And it's a very complicated situation for the neurosurgeon. There be there, You can hear a very loud systolic murmur called as a loud brew is easily heard over the eye. You can hear the blood flow between the artery and the ventricles through placing a bell of the stethoscope near the eye okay ophthalmoplegia of course due to involvement of third fourth and sixth cranial nerves and there will be marked orbital and conjunctival edema next patient presents with increased intracranial pressure and signs of papillary edema which dural sinus is primarily responsible for draining of blood from eyes and surrounding is cavernous sinus simple question Okay, that's it guys. A very simple and an easy class today. Nothing conceptual. Everything is theory in this. Out of all the things that I've covered, cavernous sinus is the most, most, most important. You can never go to exam without studying cavernous sinus, be it practicals or theory. Cavernous sinus is the most important part of today's class. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, if you have any doubts, you can reach out to us across all the different social media handles that we have. And uh, keep studying, keep reading. And I'm pretty sure you will grasp the subject. And I'm pretty sure that you will ease your examination. I wish you all the very best, guys. Thank you so much for being with us. Wish you all a very good night. Thank you.